welcome everybody. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in to our lunchtime webinar uh, as part of our webinar series this spring. My name is Anna Bly and I'm the Communications and Media Specialist here at Main Street. And this series of webinars that we've been doing over the last few weeks are providing an overview of the Main Street four-point approach. And each session is devoted to a specific point that will then kind of close the series on March 15th with how to achieve Main Street America accreditation and information about becoming a certified executive director. Um, we do require attendance for new executive directors, but we certainly invite other nonprofit leaders and board members to attend and of course share these recordings at a later date with other interested folks. Last week, we were joined by Keith Chelstrom, who covered the economic vitality point, and today's session is focused on the design point. And we're joined by Main Street Revitalization Specialist, Amy Bell, who's presenting today's webinar. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Shall I, shall I dive in, or is there dive any other administrative in. stuff you need to cover, Anna? Thank you, and thanks everyone for, uh, for joining us today during your lunch to talk about the design point. Um, this is exciting. This is obviously the thing that I'm really geeky and excited about because um, being a landscape architect, um, design is kind of like, it, it's like the magic, you know, it's, it's taking the ideas that we have and turning them into real actual physical space um, that then supports all of the other really important stuff that we do that that uh, supports our communities. So um, I'm going to jump in here to um, kind of the official, the Main Street definition of the design point, um, getting Main Street into top physical shape, capitalizing on our best assets, things like historic buildings, um, <clears throat> streets that support um pedestrian traffic um you know it's just part of it's just part of it and um so really you know design on our main streets is about creating um an inviting atmosphere a place that's, that's attractive and comfortable um and we can do that in a number of ways that we're gonna we're gonna look at and talk about um <clears throat> during the during this webinar so window displays parking, building improvements, street furniture, signage, sidewalk, street lights, landscaping, um, all of this stuff works together to, to create a, a positive message. Um, I mean, I guess, and I would say too, I would, I would tweak this a little bit. It doesn't just create a positive visual message, but I think our physical interaction with comfortable space um, <clears throat> is pretty important too for supporting um, you know, commercial and economic vitality in the district. Um, so that's from the um, National Trust Main Street Center. And I, I meant to put a little picture in here, but I got this from the, um, it's the Main Street Committee Members Handbook on Design. And I think what I'll do, I got a hard copy from Will Powell, um, and I don't know if it's available online, but I will follow up when we when we post the webinar on online later. I'll follow up and see if this is a resource that is easily accessible online as well, because there's some really great information in here about committees and design committees that I'm not really going to talk about today unless we have questions about that. Um, but it's a pretty it's a pretty good resource. Um, so. Moving into the idea of of design education, so where do we where do we start with coming up with design ideas? You know, how do we how do we figure out you know what we need? And, and a lot of times, some of this stuff is already identified for us in our downtown master plan or um, you know in the MRA plan. But sometimes we're we're starting from scratch. And so I've got some images here on some, some different ways to figure out, you know, what what does the community need? What do we need in the district? And then how do we how do we figure out how design can address those needs? Um, and then up in the up in the corner on this slide I've got just a little 
reminder that um, you know historic preservation is a, an important part of the design point and so kind of understanding um, what that means for buildings and then also the site is um, is important and we're actually I, we're going to be doing some additional webinars later on this year that will more specifically address historic preservation in design as it relates to architecture and then also how it relates to site. Um, and that's a little bit of a challenge for me because I think the, the rules about historic preservation related to buildings are, are quite a bit more clear cut, um, in my opinion, than how we deal with, with historic preservation in the streetscape and the site. Um, just because the rules are a little bit, little bit fuzzier, um, but we will delve into that more um, in in the coming year, and then also in the summer quarterly, that will be something that we we look at in return in August. Um, so one of my favorite parts of doing design is is this kind of community input stage. How do we figure out? Um, you know what a what a place is is lacking, or what what community members are able to provide. What are what are the physical assets that we have, and then the organizational the assets that we have that that um, you know can can make a design happen. So some of the images I have, um, you know, this on the on the left and the input side, that was a a visioning matrix that we just did up in Taos for a project where we asked folks to tell us things that they wanted the park to provide, um, but we had them locate those ideas within a matrix that, that required their ideas to meet the goals of the project. And if anyone's interested in what that looks like in more detail, I'd be happy to, to share that. We got some really good feedback. You know, there's there's exploration, there's kind of the more typical sort of charrette uh, situation where you get a bunch of people together and you've got aerials and you've got say, photographs and you just get the markers and the pens out and start drawing and and figuring out you know how how you could change the shape of the, the place so that it would would meet meet the needs that were identified during the input phase and then I've got this the slide on the right the experience slide which is um, something that I've started to think more about. We did a really um, interesting workshop here in Albuquerque in January that we called a, uh, it was a mobility experience workshop. And we, we got a, a bunch of people together, um, city councilors, folks from city of Albuquerque planning, uh, designers, some engineers, and we rented a whole bunch of um, uh, wheelchairs and scooters and attempted to navigate our way from transportation stops in a couple different places in Albuquerque. We were in uptown, uh, downtown at Civic Plaza, and then <clears throat> also at the North Domingo Baca Multi-Generational Center. And so um, I included that slide in here because I think sometimes when we're talking about, you know, what does the space need, what 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 does the design need to address, sometimes the best thing to do is go out be in that space and experience it um, potentially in, in different ways to understand how you know it was this the workshop was really fascinating because we we saw stuff um, clearly you know especially those of us who've never been in a wheelchair because of injury or or, or whatever reason um, but certain things about the the physical design of these spaces that make it really difficult to navigate if you have any kind of mobility issue, things like cross slope on the sidewalk, you know, sending you off into the street basically because the sidewalk slopes into the street because that's where we want drainage to go. But is that the best? Is that the best solution for people? Maybe not. Um, so it's it's interesting, interesting stuff to think about that we don't necessarily think about unless we're out in the space. Um, trying to advance here. There we go. There's the next slide. Um, Coming back to the idea of, of community engagement, um, you know, I think sometimes we think about this as like a box that we need to check off. Okay, did we did we consult the community? Are they okay with it? Great. But if we do that, we're we're missing um, we're missing a major opportunity to really build partnerships that will 
um, probably support the, the, the design and potentially the implementation funding for the project and then sustain it longer term. And it, it, what, it, what it does is it really makes sure that the, the design project that you're doing um, really sort of truly represents and addresses uh, community needs. So I've got some images here of some some ways that, you know, different ways getting us out of the um, out of the classroom, so to speak, in terms of engagement. Because I don't know about you guys, but like sometimes the word public meeting just makes me shudder because it's not they're not something that I particularly like to to do or attend because I'm I'm not you know it's like at the end of the day we want to go home to our kids and. So we've been experimenting with some some different types of events and activities, um, things where we can get uh, different age groups involved, and and um, things like the the string web we did um, for a project where we asked people to identify who they are, um, what they'd like to see, and then what they're willing to do to contribute. And and the fun thing about that one was we didn't just get the information, we also kind of created a sort of cool sculpture that, um, you know, was interactive and got people talking to each other about those questions. Um, just recently we did an activity, a paper folding activity, where we created boats and asked people to talk about their connection to the land. Um, this is a this is a project um, on a property in in Taos where they have an acequia and there's a river and there's wetlands restorations and so water is a is a really strong theme and so thinking about ways to um, get people engaged in a way you know not all of us are comfortable going to meetings and talking and speaking in front of other people and so. If you can sit down and fold some paper with someone and have a conversation with them about, you know, what they'd like to to see in a space and what they'd be willing to do to contribute, sometimes that that can be really powerful and and really helpful for the project in a way that we don't typically get information. Um, chalkboards is, is another fun um, way that that you can get input without having to be there the whole time. You can put put chalkboards out and ask a question and then, you know, take a picture at the end of the day and get feedback. And that's something that you could integrate into a vacant space. You could integrate it into like a storefront potentially. Um, and they're cheap to put together. The, the ones that we've got in the picture were built from wooden pallets and some some masonite that we painted with uh, with chalkboard paint. Um, so, um, and I think the, the really critical question here for community engagement, and it's something that, that we're working on and we'll, we'll dive into a bit more, I think, in the summer quarterly, is how do you tailor those engagement activities so that they best um, attract your community members and then get the, get the feedback that's going to be useful going, going into design? And that's something that, you know, I'm here to help with. Um, if you have a design consultant on the project, you know, that's that's their job to help you with that. So, um, again, going back to the idea of um, transformation, design is, is a transformative process. And I, I like to think of it as uh, it's, it's a physical transformation of the space once the project is built. But I think that actually going through the design process of identifying the project, getting input from the community, um, figuring out the best you know, problem solving to the best solutions um, for the space with the budget that you have. I think it's it's a transformative process for us, the design team and and um, the community as as we go through it because we learn about each other and we learn about you know how we can how we can make make a better place. Um, you know, physically, this is uh, this is Railroad Avenue uh, in uh, Las Vegas. And um, you know, sort of the imagined uh, great blocks streetscape renovation um, for that street, and you can see the you know the pretty powerful impact that doing things like adding trees and landscape parkways, uh, providing wider sidewalks, things like lighting, uh, crosswalks. Changing paving materials, you can see that the you know like the crosswalks are a slightly different paving material. There's a different paving material that kind of designates a, a certain area in this in this rendering. 
Um, and then things like curb extensions or, or those kind of the bump outs that create those parkways so that the road narrows and we slow down traffic. Um, all of those, you know, relatively minor physical changes can make a really huge impact on your experience of place. So here's an here's an example, another example of a of a pretty massive transformation um, with with not a whole lot of expensive changes. This is a breezeway um, on Tucumcari Main Street and their great blocks within their great blocks boundary, and you know simple stuff like murals, um, you know benches that the community can build, those the the pop up tents with vendors, arts and crafts, things like. Um, gateway signage. This is signage that we're looking at with um, with the folks in Tucumcari to see if the local university can their foundry can can build these for them. Um, and again, lighting. All of these things can have a, a huge impact on um, how you experience the place and whether or not you experience it. I mean, do you want to go to the picture in the upper left hand corner? Not really. <laughs> Maybe unless you want to play handball or something. Um, but the the you know imagine the, these changes to that space make a really big difference in um, how it can be used. So this is this is an image of the Great Box project in Raton, um, and so you know outcomes of of these kind of physical changes to our outdoor spaces, things like traffic calming, slowing down cars, which has multiple benefits. Not only is it a safer place, but then when cars drive slower, they look at, you have more of an opportunity to see uh, local businesses and say, oh, wow, that looks cool. I want to stop. Um, higher visibility, which is which is that that point exactly. You know, it's a, it's a more attractive place. So folks are going to notice local businesses more, more walkability. Um, again, there's really good research to show that if people are walking or riding their bike, um, they go slower, they see more opportunity, and they spend more money. And then it's kind of, it's kind of amazing. Um, social interaction is, is a big one, I think, especially with you know, how much time we all spend on our phones, if we can encourage people to interact with each other in our public spaces, that's really important interaction that, that we um, may not be getting otherwise. And so having comfortable uh, public spaces where folks can actually have face-to-face -face interactions, um, I think is, is just becoming more and more important. Um, higher property values, um, having space for your events, functional space for your events with, uh, you know, supporting infrastructure like power, um, shade, um, you know, spaces that are easy to block off from traffic potentially. Um, higher expenditures, people spending more money, reduced, uh, reduced crime. Uh, there's also good research that shows that, uh, believe it or not, street trees, um, can reduce crime in urban areas as much as 12 percent um, and it, you know it, it just sort of follows that if you have a, a well-designed space that's comfortable people want to go there you have more eyes on the street and you're going to have less uh, vandalism and crime um, cultural and historic expression is is really important um, you know first for the community to feel like it's a place where um, where we belong, that that represents our identity, that you know we can teach our children about, um, and then also for visitors to you know to be able to learn about the place and the people there, um, and of course you know promotion of of all of the great local assets that all of our all of our communities have in this state. Um, I love these before and after pictures. This um, I don't believe was a Main Street Main Street project, but this is a, a um, project that was done in Eunice, and you can see the before and after with the street trees. Holy cow! Right, big difference. Do you want to shop in the picture on the top? Do you want you know? Um, it's one of those picture is is worth a 
thousand words kind of thing. And it, they're pretty simple improvements. Street trees, um, a little bit of colored paving. What they did was they did those colored paving strips at the entrances of each of the businesses. So it really highlighted, um, you know, where, and, and it just sort of draws the eye. Like it just kind of attracts you into those buildings in a way that, um, you know, is is uh, is pretty simple. The you know the median in the in the center of the road does that narrowing of the street, so the cars will drive slower. And it also provides a, a safer way to cross the street when you have that. We call them median refuges because, and I'm sure you've all experienced this at one point or another when you're you know playing Frogger and crossing the street. It's nice to have a place where you can stop. And, and watch again for, for cars coming. Things like site furnishings, having a trash receptacle and a bench, um, you know, so you can toss your soda cup instead of having to take it with you in the car. You know, these are all things that, that make it just a, a place where you want to spend some more time. And so I will, um, I'll admit here, I kind of stole these slides from Will, because <laughs> um, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the, you know, architecture and design as well as sites. Sites kind of my area of, of experience, but um, you know, Will does does an exceptional job and has done some really cool projects with um, the different organizations across the state to do facade improvements. And that's a that's a really awesome way to very quickly make a huge physical visual um, impact on on the streetscape and on the, the downtown district. Um, and it can be as simple as as paint. And I guess I would I would make the point here too that, you know, thinking about paint, and we'll look at this in some later slides, but you can paint the facade of the building and if your municipality is okay with it, um, like in Silver City, you can paint the ground plane too. And so painting things like uh, murals um, as crosswalks or sidewalks is, is an inexpensive way to make a really fast visual change. Um, so we've got some advice here in terms of um, a palette of three colors. So this is specifically for the building facades um, with trim as a dark color. And this is this is stuff where if you you know if there's interest in doing this, Will 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 help you with, with all of these questions in terms of um, color and uh, what color goes best where. Um, things like awnings, you know, breaking up that that um, vertical plane on the building, giving it some more architectural interest. There's, there's a lot of different ways that um, that you can do that. And they have the, the function of, you know, on the rare occasion that it rains, <laughs> you've got a little bit of, of shelter and shade. I mean, and the shade the shade is a big deal. Having that little spot of refuge before the entrance of a building is a is a really nice thing to have. And um, you know, it's my understanding that this kind of this kind of addition to the building facade is typically not terribly expensive. Uh, signage, and I mean, in this this slide looks at signage on the buildings. We'll look at signage in terms of wayfinding. Um, a couple slides down, um, <clears throat> but signage is a really great way for businesses to express their identity, um, and or you know, if if um, you want to have some kind of cohesion within the district if there's similar elements and signs um, that can create a feeling of, of connection between between different locations. Um, a good sign is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Say that's probably true. Um, but that's, I mean, that's your first line of communication as a business, that's your first line of communication with potential customers. And so if they identify or they click with the graphics or the um, shape of the sign. If it's something, you know, creative like the like the hangar Main Street boutique that you see there, um, might catch your eye and and draw you in. Um, but again, here the most successful are compatible with the character of the building um, and the image of the business. And I would say that you know compatibility with the overall feeling in the district is also 
uh, important. Everything doesn't have to be the same, but but um, uh, that sense of connection is good. Windows, uh, window displays, and these um, these are all displays of you know businesses that are open. Um, but it's a great way to to market what's inside. And I guess I would I would throw out here too that um, window displays in vacant buildings uh, can be a, a great way to attract potential investors and um trying to think the the project in i think in silver city they have a window display that's artwork that's done by um folks that are in, incarcerated so it's it's um it's kind of an interesting thing that just that that makes that window space interesting instead of vacant or or falling down or dilapidated and um you know the other option is to do the the signage that says you know imagine your business here or what if this was a you know and so again you know even putting like leaning a chalkboard up on the outside to say like what what would you like this business to be or using the post-it notes um and i guess i don't know if anyone is familiar with um if, if the post-it notes or the chalkboards really interest you, take a look at uh, Candy Chang's work. If you just Google her, she does a lot of really compelling public installations that, that uh, get people interacting with a space and, and giving uh, meaningful feedback. Um, another note on historic preservation. Um, and so this this one yeah this one is it looks like they removed the wood from the facade and it it really brought back taking that wood away brought back a lot of that historic character that was still present underneath the wood um but hidden and uh so you know sort of like revealing that that um that character and and the cool buildings that are underneath um and just again i have a, a point here that you know historic preservation and, and and coordination with the um uh state the historic preservation division the hpd um is important if we're working you know with a historic building or in a historic district um if there's a chance that the building you know could be historic um, you know, there's there's tax credits that are that are available if um, you know, and if if the money that's going into the project is public, that um, you know, HPD review is is required. Um, and so that's why we like to we like to work with them. You know, if if any of those things are applicable, we like to work with them from the very beginning of the project so that we don't have any surprises down the road. It's important. Um, early in the design i think once once you have some basic concepts identified that we start to touch base with with hpd to make sure that um you know we're not going to get real far down the road with the design and and find out that uh for whatever reason that that will not be acceptable um it will have adverse effect in their language um on the on the historic character A little plug for the Main Street Facade Squad. So there's some some fun renderings there and uh, pictures of of opportunity for what can happen. Again, like a really this is Roswell um, big impact. And, and you know, Will does these projects with folks over the course of of a weekend. Um, get a few volunteers out. You can make some pretty dramatic changes um pretty pretty quickly and that's that's really cool because i think as you know we've talked about before as a group um it's really important that we have uh things happen we, we folks get bored or they get you know disillusioned if if all we do is stand around and wave our arms around with markers and and post it <laughs> they get planning fatigue and so you know it's kind of that crux of of the whole main street idea that we do um visible incremental 
catalytic projects that, that let people know, look, stuff is actually happening and we can see it and we can touch it and we can see the positive impact that it's having in terms of more people visiting these businesses or spending time downtown. And there are funds available um, for the facade improvements. And if that's something that you have questions about, you know, let us let us know, and we can we can work with you to identify the best source for those. Um, so I'm going to move into the area where I I could probably speak a little bit more intelligently than <laughs> from the architecture, which is um, placemaking. And I'll say too that I have I have I'm a little bit challenged by this term, and I know creative placemaking is is kind of you know it's it's our jargon it's the language that we use to talk about rebuilding places um but in a lot of our communities i really feel like it it should be more like place revealing like we're not in a lot of these places creating something new we're actually just like with the building facades we're kind of peeling back and looking at you know those community assets and those things that are um those really valuable interesting things that are already there um, so the, this this is a, a sort of a um, inspirational board that we just put together recently for uh, Silver City Main Street, looking at a parklet that um, a local business owner at a, a auto an old auto shop um, wanted to uh, create. So they entered into a partnership with the town. So they will, the business owner will pay for the parklet improvements and then the town um, will lease that space and then maintain it. And then that in, in that partnership, the town also accepts liability um, for the use of that space. So again, looking at, at stuff that's, you know, simple, like wooden benches that can be built by the community or, you know, in the lower left-hand corner, the the pop-up shade structures, which is kind of, you know, it's like steel pipe and um, tape, but you get this really incredible, colorful space that, um, it, you know, is, is easy to, for the community to do in a short period of time. Um, one of the things we're looking at at that project is uh, capturing roof um, runoff, rainwater that falls on the roof and, and directing it into the planter areas, but if you're doing that, there's an opportunity potentially to do something a little bit more interesting with those downspouts and gutters. Um, and this particular project, <clears throat> excuse me, has a, a, a sculpture from a, a, a metal sculpture that I think is fairly well known, but um, lives lives there. And uh, let's see, do I have the rendering of that next? I do. So that's the sculpture, when you stand on one side of the sculpture and look through it, it, it um, you see the, where the North Star is. You also happen to look across the street right at the museum, which is, which is really cool. And so we, we have worked with uh, Silver City Main Street to come up with an idea of, you know, how do you find the North Star? Well, you use the Big Dipper. And so could we work with one of the local tile um, businesses or, you know, another local gallery or, or art business to inlay um, the Big Dipper constellation on the ground plane of that parklet so that you find the um, the North Star Pass that way. Um, so again, the, you know, sort of benches that are easy to build. Uh, this particular business owner does not want to do wood. She doesn't want to take care of it. So, you know, we're looking at options with her on other materials, steel, um, trucks, decking, um, and she's she's okay with the with the higher price tag, and so we can we can look at different materials that may not take as much work to take care of. Um, simple stuff like ornamental grasses can really soften a space, um, and you only have to deal with those once a year. You cut them cut them down in the spring before they start turning green and you've got year-round color and texture and a lot of them have really cool seed heads um, but you can see how and I, I apologize I don't have a before picture here but this is a pretty massive transformation of the space it's basically an asphalt parking lot right now I'm going to talk a little bit about wayfinding um, and I think for so many of our communities, this is really 
critical because if we the way that that you know our highways bypass our downtowns now and i think about like raton you know you can blast right by and you have no idea that um all of the really cool stuff that's downtown uh is even there and so having having that signage to first let people know hey something is here and you might be interested in this but then once you get people there having that kind of cohesive graphic um you know branding really um downtown that lets people know where am i and and where else can i go that's interesting and how do i get there um you know this is the, the slide we've got is some signage that was proposed for artesia um you know another another thing that i've i've uh, talked with folks about in the sort of transportation planning arena is wouldn't it be nice if we could provide signs for people especially like like this one um the pedestrian directional signage tell people this is how you this is the direction for this it's this far and it's going to take you this long to walk there so there's no question about like i want to go to the pat garrett sculpture it's going to take me 10 minutes to walk there oh i can do that i've got time that's easy um so sometimes if we if we tell people of that kind of stuff it um helps encourage them to go because they realize it's close like santa rosa i think about um with their park lake and blue hole and it's really like a 15 10 or 15 minute walk from those uh recreational resources to downtown but if you're in those places and you don't know you might think well that's really that's too far it's too far for me to go but really it's it's not far at all there's some um examples of Silver City's recent wayfinding work to develop uh, a signage. And so again, just sort of creating this repeated theme um, in the mural map. I love this idea and it's something that we have talked with uh, Tukum Carey maybe considering doing it in that, in that breezeway that I showed you earlier. Um, like a, a mural on the wall and potentially even we're looking at doing it on the ground plane that is a map of the Main Street District or, you know, the larger um, community area that could identify the Main Street District, but that I, that would show um, the major attractions in the place. So again, you're letting people know, hey, there's all this stuff here that you can go check out because um, most of the time if we don't know about it if it's not on Google Maps um, we're just gonna keep driving <laughs> so we see the the big flashy sign that that does attract our attention so and this again is something paint um, is not expensive we have a lot of talented muralists in our communities and there's muralists um, and I think in Tucumcari we're looking at potentially working with the corals uh, who they can they can pull out the the framework of the mural and then you can work with local school groups or church groups or you know other community members to actually paint the mural and and i think that that opportunity to really work with community members and, and have have community members do the project is is excellent because then you get that connection and buy-in um looking at urban design um this is this is some fun stuff that we've have thought about with um with silver city they're looking at doing a kind of a vendor space rental so if you you know are an arts and crafts uh vendor and or a musician and you want to rent a space for a year you can rent a space on these streets that are between um <clears throat> silver city's main street bullard and the the big ditch and you can sell your stuff there year round so we're looking at some other sort of temporary paint mural um string lights uh bike racks that say the name of the street or say main street um all stuff that that can be done by the community or relatively inexpensively to to make a big impact and create that sense of place um some more examples this um where are we here 
Main Street. Where did I pull this one from? Anyway, I think just a, you know some additional examples of the streetscape improvements that I talked about already. The idea of a, oh, this is Farmington. That's where this is. So this is uh, the proposed Main Street improvements in Farmington, which includes some roundabouts, and you can see the curb, the curb bump outs. And this is this is the this is the project that um, the city um, folks voted to uh, pay for this entire project with bond bond funds. So that's that's pretty exciting for them. I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. Um, Los Alamos. You can see the the impact that street trees and the curb bump outs and the parkways have on making it a place where, you know, if you have that kind of buffer between you and the cars, um, it just it's a more comfortable place to walk and to be. A uh, little plug for the downtown master plans, the MRA plans, MRA designations. There's um, there's several communities in the state that are currently um, updating their MRA boundary um, and or um, getting an MRA plan. Main Street will, will assist with the um, MRA designation and then we'll work to coordinate with um, an MFA for the reimbursable grant to hire a, a consultant to do the MRA plan with you. So um, and and general and like most most things, you know, if you have if you have a plan and you can show how particular projects are are going to be implemented, if you have those the, you know the cool design renderings and the um, you know of course you need the the cost estimates that go with that to to go after funding, but but. Having this kind of larger plan in place is is really critical for being able to um, convince funders that that the project is real and it's doable and it's part of a larger thing. And there's, I mean, there's some there's several funding sources where if the project is not part of your downtown or MRA plan, you are not eligible for that funding. So um, if um, if it's something that your community is interested in, um, you know, please get in touch with me, and and we'll figure out um, what we need to do. And so yeah, so on that on that note, more information or questions, I've got my cell phone number on here, the 925 number, and then um, Will is also available if your if your question is more architecturally focused. Um, he is there to help. So I think now I've left enough time for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yeah, and feel free. I realize we didn't go over this before we started the session. Um, you can raise your hand or uh, type in a question if you'd like to, um, and we can unmute you if you've got your microphone on on your computer if you or if you called in. Um, conversely, we know sometimes this stuff might be driving home or doing something later on that you think about this presentation and, you know, a question comes up, you can always contact um, Will or Amy directly. And we do have one question from Henry Rowe. Hello, Henry. Hello. 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 Did you have a question for us? Uh, yeah, I wrote it down and sent it to you, but basically oh. it's... Go ahead. It's the basic question is when uh, the main street in town is a state highway, it's under the control of the Department of Transportation in Santa Fe. And their objectives are not necessarily the same as the local objectives. Yes. How do you convince um, them? How do you convince them that uh, how do we they, how do we help the DOT see the light? <laughs> Yes. Uh, that's a it's a really it's a really good question and um it's it's an it's a challenge in a lot of our main street communities because that street is most often DOT right of way and so there's requirements related to the shape of that street that the DOT knows about and they're looking at traffic counts and they're looking at uh do we have to route semi trucks off I-40 if there's a wreck and that's why we have to keep this road four lanes. But the good news is that just last year, 
the DOT adopted um, a road diet guide. And so it's actually basically one of their, they call them design directives. And so every time a new project is, is considered, they've got to go through this process of saying, is a, is a road diet appropriate? And if, if you guys aren't familiar with that term, um, I think it's actually an awful term because nobody likes to diet, <laughs> right? Um, but basically, it's a lane reduction. So if your roadway is four lanes, a road diet might take it down to, you know, two lanes with a with a center um, median or a bike lane. So you look at that total right of way and figure out can we get bike lanes or widen the sidewalks within the right of way. And and so you know, again, I think similar to to HPD, and I'm I'm really glad you brought it up because DOT is the other. Um, big gorilla that that we have to work with um, is is just really starting to communicate with them the the um, you know the regional or the area engineer um, that you know that applies to your location um, work, try to work with them early in the process to to see um, you know if if those kinds of changes are acceptable and I think in Santa Rosa. Their MRA plan recommended a road diet, and I believe that they got the DOT to go along with it. And um, uh, you know, sometimes you know rules are rules, but I think the other thing that's important to know is that when DOT does projects, they are required to consult the community, and they do have a a um, responsibility to to listen to the community. And so sometimes. It, it's a matter of facilitating um, that understanding to let DOT know, hey, look, we have gotten this community input, and sometimes that communication has to come from the municipality to the DOT, um, that this is what the community told told us that they, they want. Um, and like, like many things, communication is, is a big part of it. But, um, you know, I don't know about your situation in particular and if you wanted to talk about it in more detail we could we could definitely um, um, do that but I hope that that kind of starts to answer that question about you know how do we we, we want to think about it as, as more of a conversation and a partnership with the DOT than a than a conflict because that that often just um, doesn't doesn't get us anywhere um, and I know that they can sometimes be difficult to work with and not responsive and so that's where you know, the revitalization specialists, so we can come in and, and help with that as well. Thank you. Sure. Great. All right. Well, um, we'll invite other folks to type in questions if you'd like, or if someone else would like to raise your hand. Um, but again, as Amy uh, Bell reiterated at the end of the presentation, her contact information, as well as William Powell's, are there, um, our revitalization specialists. Um, are great about getting in contact with folks who kind of reach out to them, and especially as it relates to this presentation today as well. We will, as we kind of talked about briefly um, for last week's webinar, we make these um, presentations available on the Main Street YouTube channel. And if you go to the Main Street homepage, which is at www.nmmainstreet.org, the social media uh, icons are there, including YouTube, so you can kind of click onto the YouTube channel and catch up on the webinars we've been, been presenting this spring, as well as earlier ones. Um, and all of those will be there. Uh, Amy mentioned also a resource around design that she had has gotten from Will. Um, when we send up the follow-up, for this webinar, you know, with the link to the presentation, we can maybe add that resource as well um, to all of you who joined. So thank you um, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your lunch hour and of course invite you to share the webinar with other board members or community members who might be interested in learning more about the Main Street Four Point Approach. And of course, in today's specific topic uh, related to design, and we thank Amy Bell so much for presenting today. Thanks so much, Amy, for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. I hope I hope it was a helpful presentation for everyone. All right. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>